here today with Chuck Thus. Chuck is a really interesting man, and he's doing really good and valuable work, in my opinion. Uh, you'll hear today that we're talking about a subject that uh, I visit a lot, whether write about or talk about, and that is uh, the state of uh, of mental health, and uh, particularly in this country. And uh, I, I was introduced to Chuck uh, just a few months ago. He spoke at an evening event here in New York City at a family office a, a group meeting, and he was the opening speaker. Within just a few minutes, Chuck, you owned the crowd. I know you owned me, but I, I could see around me that you owned the crowd. You could hear a pin drop as you told your story. Uh, it just captured the audience attention. Chuck, you were born in Canada in a small town. What kind of upbringing did you have there? What kind of a life situation did you have there in Canada? It, it was really good, Jim, and thank you so much for having me on today and, and for your kind words. I'm very grateful for those. So um, my upbringing was really good. I, I was born into a family that uh, both my parents came as immigrants from Holland, and uh, they arrived on the, the shores of Canada at a very young age, and, and they really only knew one thing or two things, really, family and, and work ethic. And mm -hmm. I was very grateful that my parents took hold of that and really instilled that in us as well, of my brother and sister. Uh, work ethic is something they came with, and it was just no question that uh, you and your two siblings in this tiny little three-kid family, <laughs> compared to what they were used to, uh, I, I would imagine old enough to walk, old enough to do chores. Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's exactly how it was. And, and I'll never forget one of my mom's favorite sayings to me, uh, because I used to be a visitor. I used to love to visit, as you probably well knew from the, the night we had together in New York City. I love to visit. Um, and my mom always used to tell me that if I couldn't talk and work at the same time, please don't talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that it was time to work, and that's what we needed to do. Yeah. Uh, sports are an important part of your life from an early age, I assume, as a Canadian in an agricultural setting. Uh, skates were something that you maybe were on before you were balancing on your bare feet. <laughs> yes, very much so. Uh, my, my older brother led the way with hockey. And, and what was really neat is that my mom really didn't know if I'd want to play. But at the young age of three, she figured, you know what, you're here too. Instead of you running around the arena, let's let's put you on the ice and see if it's something you're interested in doing. So um, in the winters, it was hockey. In the summers, it was baseball, golf, soccer. Uh, kick the can, you name it. We, we were always outside doing something. Yeah. And tell me about school. Uh, where did you go to school? How far was it from where you lived? It, we went to school about 10 miles from our home uh, in another small town that only had about 2,700 people, but um, all the kids were pretty much bust. A lot of the kids were bust in because it was a lot of farm, farm families that were coming into school. Uh, yep. And I was raised in a Catholic family. So we went to Catholic school growing up. Uh, but it was I, really that, that's setup. surprising because I would have suspected coming from the Netherlands that you wouldn't be Catholic. Yes, we, we were. And, um, and, and we grew up in the Catholic church and, and the Catholic school. Um, and, and really everything was good. I mean, I look back, I have a lot of fond memories and, and many of my friends now ask me, what in the world did you do in a town of less than 500 people? But I can assure you, Jim, we were never bored. It was street hockey. It was pond <laughs> hockey. It was soccer. It was baseball. It was golf. Whatever the season was, all the kids in town, and there was a bunch of us, um, we, we all got together and split up teams, and away we went. It sounds, frankly, like a pretty idyllic upbringing. It, it, it was. You're a skilled hockey player because you've been doing it your whole life. You have natural athletic abilities, and you decide you're going to play hockey uh, in, in the U.S. at a big-time school program. And smart as you are, you didn't go to school in Minnesota. You went to school in Miami. <laughs> yes, yes, it was, it was good. And, um, and that was one of the, one of the better decisions and, and a very great opportunity that I had come along. Um, and I, I thank God every day for that because the game of hockey has given me so much, including my education, my wife, my two kids. And, and it's still offers me the opportunities like this one today to sit and visit with you. Now, you, you tell a great story of, of the stick to the resilience you had, because you were an instant star at the University of Miami and walked on as a star player, right? Yes, or so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> at least I thought I was. Um, yeah, I was a walk-on because I had played some 
what the NCAA considered to be professional hockey the year before. And so I had lost my NCAA eligibility and, but Miami was willing to appeal that. And uh, because of that, I was, I was deemed I needed to walk on just in case it didn't work out. So, um, and, and things, as most people would say, didn't work out for my first three years. How much ice time did you see in game? For my first three years, I didn't see a minute of varsity ice hockey time. Not I got a minute. Out. Not a minute. But you're still there. And by the way, when hockey season's over, what are you doing? I'm working out. And a lot of times I'm going back to my home in, in Ontario and mm -hmm. driving 30 or 45 minutes to the gym so I can work out and get stronger and uh, just kind of doing my thing to continue to get better and better and just stick to it. So you're working, you're working out and you're, you're a goaltender. Yes. And, uh, and you think you're pretty good and you find out that mm, coaches think there's some people better. In fact, everybody is better, but you're on the team and you stick to it. So three years, all that working out, all that perseverance, not a minute of ice time in a game. What happens in your senior year? I was actually cut from our program after my sophomore year, but, uh, but many people would say that goaltenders aren't the smartest guys on the ice. I may, <laughs> <laughs> I may argue that a little bit, but, uh, but I came back my junior year and, and it was very much the same gym. I didn't play at all. As a matter of fact, I only practiced about five or six times with the varsity team that year. I was with mm -hmm. the, the JV team the whole year, uh, but came back my senior year, had an opportunity to try out for the varsity team and, uh, and made it as the backup goalie. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was a I was a pretty happy guy to say the least. But then you get some ice time. I did, I did, yes, sir. Six six games in, we were playing at Bowling Green State University, and uh, we had about ten minutes left in the game, and we were losing six two. And the coach looked at me. He says, "Chuck, let's go. You're in." And I looked at him, and he says, "Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> you let's go. You're in." And, and I, I I wasn't really sure what to think, but I I jumped over the boards, grabbed my mask, and grabbed my stick, and away I went. And um, I'll, I'll never forget, Jim, the feeling of standing there in the middle of uh, Slater Ice Arena at, at Bowling Green. And I just kind of looked around, looked at my teammates, and I stood there and I started to cry. Um, here, here I was, at my dream, I, I was living it. And all the the work that I had put in, um, it was it was paying off in that moment. And, and, and I remember thinking to myself, if I don't play another 10 minutes, if I don't play another game, no matter what, these 10 minutes, I'm going to live them to the fullest and I'm going to enjoy it. And, uh, and I've done it. And, uh, but that little did I know at that moment and, and my friend Andrew Miller at the time came back and he told me it was just the beginning. I thought he was crazy, um, <laughs> but um, it, it worked out that that was really just the beginning of, of really a, a, an Amer a miracle season and a, and a season that, one that I'll never forget. It's stuff that movies are made of, Chuck. And this movie uh, has a has a happy ending in terms of that year and your uh, your hockey experience in big time college hockey in the U.S. So, what was the rest of that year like after that ten minutes of ultimate payoff for the time, the effort, the endless hours you would put in? So the the following weekend uh, we had played Ohio State, and I did not play Friday night, but uh, the coach came to me Saturday morning and said that I was going to play Saturday night. And uh, I went on to beat Ohio State that night four to two. And uh, he came to me and said, if I continue to play like that, I'd play a lot that year. And I was like, well, thank you, coach. And, and I really, again, Jim, I didn't know what that meant. I had no expectations. But but the way it played out is I played every game but one the rest of the year. That's and, amazing. Yes. And um, at the end and, of the year. And named All-American. I was. Yes, sir. I was named Miami Hockey's first ever first team All-American. Um, I was Miami's athlete of the year and team MVP. There was there was all kinds of things that uh, that I was um, lots of awards I was given for my effort that year. And, and one of them was called the Terry Flanagan Award. What's that given out for, Chuck? That one, believe it or not, because I still, you know, all these years later, I have a hard time wrapping my head around being a first team All-American. I don't really know what that means to this day. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, I have a hard time just grasping that one, but the Terry Flanagan award is given to someone that overcomes great adversity in a career. And, and for me, that one, um, and, and it's not that the all American one doesn't mean anything because it's very, very important, but that one really, I think speaks to my heart and to my character, because I know all the crying I did, all the hard work I put in the time I spent alone, just believing in myself 
that I could do it. And, and at the end of it, someone else looked at me and said, you know what, we recognize that and we see that. And, and that's a great character that you have within you. So keep that, keep going. And we want to reward you for that. Indeed. Indeed. Now you go on after college to play in a professional hockey. Uh, you, uh, you stay around the sport for a, a dozen years or so, both uh, playing and then coaching. And then you had an ownership in an uh, ownership interest in a, in the Mississippi surge. So all the things that feed your interest are around you and you stick with that a long time. And it, then you, then you say, well, look, I, I got, I got to make sure, uh, I've been lucky enough to meet this gal and she's uh, and we've been lucky enough as a couple that we're knocking out a couple of kids here, beautiful little girls. And uh, I got to make sure I'm doing the right thing financially for them. And you start a business uh, in the South uh, doing uh, sports equipment. So you're doing a lot of things. You're keeping busy. Life seems pretty perfect. On the surface, it seemed pretty perfect. Chuck had it all. Chuck, you're back in, in those playing days in high school and college. Uh, what's it like before you go out on the ice? As I moved and played professional hockey, before every game that I played, I'd get sick. I was either over a garbage can or over a toilet, physically getting sick. And, you know, back in the 90s, Jim, nobody asked why. Like, nobody said, Chuck, what's wrong? Are you okay? Do you need something? Do you need a doctor? No. What it meant was, is that Chuck was ready to play. And if Chuck was over the can or over the gar uh, toilet, Let's go. He's ready. We need to be ready. Let's go win. And and even as I was coming back to my to get my equipment after after getting sick, guys were high five and tapping me on the pads. You know, this is good. This that, is good. That was, that was Chuck. Yeah, that's that's just what it was. And and I didn't really think anything of it either um, because nobody really said anything. And 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 mental health wasn't a thing. Mental health wasn't spoke about. Um, and, You're a tough so, guy from Canada. You've been around hockey, which is all tough people. You just suck it up. You you get the God doesn't know. Nature doesn't know. That field has to be tended to. You do it. So you're you're a tough guy. Why would you even ask about what you were feeling? Yeah, and and that's really exactly what it was. Is we had the mentality that you put your head down, you just go, you don't say anything, you don't show weakness, you don't ask questions. You don't share your feelings. You just go and put your head down and, and go through it. Don't go around it. Go through it. And, and that's really what I was doing. Um, I was just finding a way to go through it and suppressing anything that was going on. But it was a key to your athletic success. It was a key to your successes as a person. But it was also the key to not addressing this underlying illness. And it was making it worse. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It really played both sides. It played the, the good and the bad, I guess, if you would like to say, because that mentality that I had of just keep going and just put your head down and don't stop and, and believe in yourself. That's what got me to be an All-American. That's what got me to do the things at Miami and play pro hockey. But at the same time, it was being a detriment because as I was suffering in silence, I was having the same mentality. Just keep going, put your head down, don't ask questions, don't share, don't ask for support, just keep going and work through it. You will get through Chuck, it. Chuck, what's that like? You said you're suffering in silence. What does it mean you were suffering? What was going on? Jim, it, it, it was really, it was lonely. To say it was lonely was, was probably an understatement. And- But you were in a crowd. Are you lonely in a crowd? Very much, very much. There's people around. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's days that I still have that, believe it or not. Um, I now have tools to work through that and, and things I know how to do to work myself through that. But you can be in a room of 500 people and feel completely alone because you're not, you don't know how to share your feelings. I didn't know how to put words to what I was feeling or what was going on. I remember very vividly standing in my living room and and just I came out of our bedroom, my wife was standing there and I was just crying, shaking and crying. And she's like, what's wrong? And I said, I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. Um, and I look back now and I was full of anxiety. I was completely depressed. Um, really just wanted the pain to stop. And I didn't know how to verbalize what I was going through. And I didn't know how to share it with her. 
she just looked at me, she gave me a hug and she says, just know that I love you and I'll do anything I can to help you. I just don't know what to do. And I said, I don't know what you can do either because I don't know what to do with what I'm, what I'm feeling. And this is where we come to a crossroads. Some wives would be frightened, ashamed, not sure what to do themselves and wouldn't know how to respond. And you're so lucky that your wife put an arm around you and said, it's okay, we're gonna get through this together. That Absolutely. doesn't always happen. No, it doesn't. And I know that there's plenty of guys that I've played with that have now uh, also verbalized what they've gone through. And, and they've been through one, two, three divorces um, just because their significant others just don't know how to support them. They can't put up with the, uh, with the behavior um, because it's, it can be hard. I mean, it was hard to live with myself at times because I didn't know it was a roller coaster. I mean, you, you go from being on top of the mountain to being at the bottom of the mountain in minutes. Part of that came from really wanting guarantees in life. I wanted to know that I was going to be on the best team. I wanted to know that I was going to play in college. I wanted to know that I was going to play professional. And, and when you live always in the future, that's where that anxiousness comes from because you're trying to control everything that's really uncontrollable when all we can control and we have very little control over that I have found out is this particular moment. All you and I have is this conversation with each other. That's it. This, this, this is where our life is right here, right now. Yes, we have many things outside of it. We have families, we have businesses, we have all these other things. But the truth of the matter is, is that all Jim and Chuck have is this moment with each other. And when, when this uh, conversation is over, then we'll have that moment. Um, and, and that was a real awakening for me and something that I really try to live by today, which has helped me tremendously, tremendously. And I always, re I use the saying, be where my feet are, be where my feet are. And that helps me stay present moment and not living in the future. As a kid, did you have close friends with the kids in that small community, 500 people playing sports all the time, working together, going to school together? Did you have friendships then that were deep and meaningful? And did that, uh, did that happen in all stages of your life? I'm lucky enough to have great adult friends and I work at it because I'm, I'm very blessed, but I wonder how that was in your life and how you think back about those relationships you had and the depth of them. I, I know I had one really, really close friend and we were very, very close. I mean, yep. We were like peas and carrots, as, as Forrest Gump would say. We were very close. And, mm -hmm. um, and then something happened in sixth grade, and I'll never forget that, where, where our lives just kind of took a turn. I, I went to the right and he went to the left or whichever way you want to say it. But, yep. um, and then after that, I had some, some, some what I would call more surface level friendships. Um, I was very protected of myself. And even through college, I know I had some some close friends, but that has that has changed kind of since my hitting rock bottom in 2008 and and working through all the things that I worked through. Um, I have some what I would say very meaningful friendships now, and and it's something that I work on probably more now than I ever have, and because I value that closeness and. Um, I don't have it as much here where I live now. Uh, most of my friends live out of town, and I'm sure there's there's something to that as well that I would love to dig into, whether it's still me not allowing people to get in to, to understand really what Chuck is going through certain days and certain times. And if my friends are are further away, they don't have to see that. Yep. Um, because because every day, is, is it's a new day. And it's a day that I have to be mindful. It's a day that I have to make sure I'm taking care of me. Um, and, and I think if people aren't close by to see that, then I'm able to protect myself if that makes any kind of sense. It does, uh, Chuck. And uh, uh, look, we both know people who get up in the morning, fall out of bed and make five new friendships every day. Uh, some That happens to a few people. For most of us, we have to work at it. And it's something we have to uh, be deliberate about and open about. Uh, it's just a realization that we need those relationships. I think back to my parents' generation, you know, uh, 
My, my father was in the service at the very end of World War II. And I think of the, the relationships he had, you know, they, it was a little different, you know, than you and I. Uh, he he lived in the neighborhood he grew up in. So he had friends who were friends from, like you had your buddy up through the sixth grade. They were friends their whole adult life. There was a, diff, a different cadence in terms of you grew up, you went into the service, college, if you did that sports if you did that and then he came back he worked in the same community you grew up in so you had lifelong relationships when you move around and when you uh, work in different markets and you travel a bunch you have to work a different cadence because you and i need those relationships they're important to our mental health and i'd like to think that we're important to our friends mental health i agree with you 100 percent, jim and and like i said the last several years friendships and close relationships have have brought new meaning to me and new meaning and and what i have found as well that one thing that i struggled with for a long time was liking myself and i think that was part of not wanting to let people get close and because i was i felt different because of the things that i was working through and dealing with the you know the anxiety the depression not really being able to put a, a name to it but just Chuck didn't like it because I felt like I was different. I didn't like being different. Was there the Chuck that you you wanted people to see and then that other questioning one inside who I really don't belong here. I I'm, I don't really am not worthy of this. Is, is, is it, are there two voices? A hundred percent. A hundred percent, Jim. And and that's something that that still to this day, I think I work through. And I'm becoming, I finally become to a place that I like who Chuck is. And I don't say that arrogantly. I just, I realize that I'm different. And, but that different is a gift. And being different has given me an opportunity to be of service and to work with people and to share things that I've been through in hopes that I can help their journey and make their journey better through this, through this life cycle that we're in. And, but I never really accepted that until probably, I'm going to say now I'm, I'm just over 50. So maybe eight or nine years ago, I finally started to accept that. So it hasn't, it's not very new for me. I mean, it's pretty new, I should say, for me to, yep. to really accept and love who I am. For, for the purposes of, of uh, giving a, a lifeline to uh, our friends and community members here, which you're, you are doing here, let's talk a little bit about what it's like when it's bad. We all know people, are people who've suffered with severe anxiety and depression. And we don't know what to do. And we don't know how to recognize it. And some, lots of times we just can't even understand what does that feel like? Chuck, what does that feel like when it's really low? It, it's, there's a lot of words, Jim, that come to mind. Um, and, and I get emotional when I talk about it because it's, um, it's very lonely. It's, it's, and people hear the words lonely and dark, but you feel like you're not worth anything. Like the world would be better without you. The world wouldn't miss you. Um, that you're not really bringing any benefit to anything or anyone. Is there a sense of uh, it's painful and you don't know what to do about it? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You feel like you're a hamster in a wheel. Like when you go to the pet store and you see that hamster running on the hamster wheel, you feel just like that and you have no idea how to jump off. And it goes from one day to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And um, and, and there's no way to stop it. You, you just, you're in your head, you hear voices. The voices are telling you all kinds of things um, from you're no good to you're useless to your wife doesn't love you. She's just settled for you. Your kids are looking at you and they're thinking, what the heck? How did this guy become my dad? To this day, Jim, I thank my wife because she really protected our kids while I was going through that. She kept them busy. She had them playing school and playing dress up and doing all kinds of things. And I was, I, she was picking spots where I was maybe in a good place for them to interact with me more. She had to be exhausted at the end of every day. And and it was just what she did. And, and to this day, she'll just tell you that she just did what she had to do. I believe that she was divinely put in my life um, because without her and without the lady that I called, um, 
I feel pretty certain that you and I aren't having this conversation today. Were there times that you were out of options? You couldn't see a way out. The hole was deep and dark and you thought maybe the world would be better without you? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and I had those thoughts often. Um, and I don't know, Jim, that I really wanted to die. I, I don't know if I can honestly say that. I just wanted the pain to stop. But I didn't know how to how to have the pain stop. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the knowledge. So when you don't know how to do that, if I don't know how to stop the pain, there was only one way that I knew how to stop it. And, and that was to, to take my life. Because that would definitely stop it. And I wouldn't have to be on this hamster wheel and in this darkness and be doing it alone any longer. Now, my wife and my kids wouldn't understand. Um, they would, they would, you know, live the rest of their life without me. And I had lost a very, very close friend back in 2006. Um, and he, he died by suicide. He was a former coach of mine that I got very, very close with. And, and I remember speaking with his wife and kids and, and all that they went through and still go through today, every January on the anniversary of his passing. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't get easier even all these years later and i didn't want to put my my wife and kids through that that that's that's the out of self realization that saved you and yeah. doesn't save everybody in fact uh i've heard you talk chuck about the fact that it seems to be a disproportionate issue with high performance athletes why do you think that is i think they once they once we lose that sense of of belonging to a team Jim when we identify as a hockey player as a football player as a baseball player pick your sport it doesn't matter we identify that that's who we are and once we are no longer that who are we if I'm not a hockey goalie who is Chuck like what am I bringing what value do I bring what is my purpose and we lose that sense of belonging. We lose that sense of purpose. We lose that sense of knowing who we are. And that was a lot of the things that I went through and, and really figured out um, in my eight year journey uh, following my call for help. And those are some of the things that I help athletes with today because I, I often say, and I'll say to them more than once, you are not just a hockey player. It's just what you do really well. You're not really a hockey player. It's just something you do well. That's, that's, it took, it only took you about 40 plus years to figure that out. <laughs> Thank God you did. Yeah. I was thinking, Thank I said gymnast. I was thinking a young lady, Simone Bowles, uh, who, uh, uh, Biles rather, who uh, uh, had her mental health issues on center stage in the Olympics. And I think of uh, heroic people like uh, 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 Phelps, uh, the swimmer who's been public about his mental health challenges. The good news is you you got help. And this is where I really need your help, which is to help us understand when we have uh, these issues ourselves, or when we have people in our lives who are suffering with, they're just not right, they're just not getting in the game, they're, they're withdrawing. What can we do to help someone around us who's in pain? I write a pretty good section in my book that I'm that I'm working through right now about red flags and and self medication Jim is a big one, whether it be with alcohol drugs um, and, and really almost self abuse is is they you know that is a big one that's something that I went through. Um, and I didn't I have never used drugs but uh, but alcohol played a pretty important part in my life in a lot of different times when it came to dealing with my anxiety. Because I yep. thought that, you know, if I could suppress it, then I felt better, right? But little did I know on the other side of that was depression, just waiting with open arms. Yep. Um, so I would say that self-medication is one or self, even self, lack of self-care is a big one. There's an inverse behavioral reward for people who are having these issues who self-medicate. They drink, they do drugs, because now we as a culture, oh, I know what to do. We have to get them into a program. We have to get them professional help to treat the issue. And we're mistaking the issue to being the abuse. 
Yes. But 100%. that's just a symptom of the broader issue of the inner turmoil. A hundred percent. If I'm your friend, you're going through these problems and you aren't uh, uh, abusing alcohol or drugs, but I know you're having problems. What will I do? What should I do? What, what should your friends, what should your coaches have been advised to do to help Chuck and the other Chucks out here? I would just encourage the, the people that know that other people are suffering is to, to give them a safe space and let them know that it's okay, whatever it is they're dealing with, it's okay. Because the biggest thing that we do is we, we make it not okay. Even, even as a society to this day, Jim, we're still stigmatizing mental illness, that it's a bad thing, or you know what could they be dealing with? I mean, I, I think of like Simone Biles, like you said, Carey Price for the Montreal Canadiens makes $10 million a year. And he hasn't played, he didn't play at all this past season because he's working through some things. And people have said to me, what in the world could he be dealing with? How bad could his world be? The stigma is still there and it's still real, huh? It's still alive and well, unfortunately. Um, but I think giving people a safe place to just be vulnerable and to open up and to share and just say, listen, I'm not going to judge you. Whatever you're going through, I want to help you. But you have to verbalize it. And you may not have the exact words. Just talk and give them space to talk. And that's, that's what I was given when I called. And that really saved my life. That greatest generation ever, they didn't have psychologists or social workers or a therapist, uh, and they just toughed it out, and they pushed through it, Chuck. But now you're saying we shouldn't do that. What was the consequence of that greatest generation not being able to talk about these things and not being able to deal with it? It looks like, well, they just went on, it was fine, but maybe it wasn't. Yeah, and I don't know that it was. I think like when I talk to my parents um, and learning a lot of the things that they went through and my dad would tell you to this point and, and my mom, uh, I lost her in June, but she would share with me as well that they just suppressed all their feelings and, and they just kept pushing through and, and they acknowledge now that that probably wasn't the best thing to do, but that's all they knew how to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's the beautiful thing as we see, uh, and I'll use the word evolution, but the evolution of us as humans we're starting to understand now that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay. But the critics will say we're softening up. We're encouraging uh, this kind of behavior. And you'd say. I, I would say, I don't really agree with that. I think what it's doing is it's making us more vulnerable, but it's making us stronger. And, and yeah. because I think the more that we can share who we are, and what we're going through, just like you and I are having this conversation today, somebody somewhere will hear this. And they may say, and I'm not going to say they will, but they might say, wow, this guy played professional hockey and he's opening his heart like this. Maybe I can do it too. That's why I applaud you that you made it your life's mission to share your story with the intent to help other people. You got help. You got a number, a name and a number. Tell us what happened. I remember driving down the interstate that day in 2008 when I was going to drive my truck into a guardrail. And the, the flash of my daughters came through my fate, my, my mind. I was crying and, I, and something had me pull over. And that something for me was God. And, and whether people believe that they have the same belief as me, it's okay, whatever you believe. I, I believe that God pulled me over and he said, this wasn't your time. And now rewind the clock three to four years earlier. My mother had given me a, a business card of a lady back just outside of the town that I grew up in Ontario. And she said, if you ever need anything, she said, give this lady a call. She's amazing. And she can help you. So, okay. <laughs> and, and at that point, I really didn't know what that was all about. My mom and I always had a great relationship. My mom was one of my best friends. We talked about everything. My mom knew everything about me. And right up to the, to the day that she passed, um, there wasn't a thing that my mom didn't know because I would just, we, we became that close. and. On some level, she knew that I was going to need something or, or God was intervening and placing this in my life for when it was needed. Because when I pulled over that day, Jim, I just reached right in my pocket and pulled that business card out without a thought. It wasn't in my mind to do this. I just literally went in my pocket, grabbed that card that I had kept for three or four years. And why I did is the only thing I can say is that, that I knew on some level I was going to need it. and. 
I made that call to, and, and the lady's name is Sheila Butcher. And I, I, I remember her answering the phone and she says, hello. And cause she didn't know my number. She didn't know me. And I just said, you know, my name is Charles Thus, and you don't know me, but you know my mom and I don't want to live anymore. And, and the phone went silent. And I thought to myself, oh boy, I got the courage to call somebody to, to just scream for help. And now the phone is silent. And this was all going, and, and it, to me, it seemed like minutes that the phone was silent, but it was probably just seconds. And she came back and she said, you're going to be okay. I remember saying, the hell I am. I said, I certainly don't feel okay. I said, and quite frankly, I really don't want to live. I'm done. And she said, are you willing to, to talk with me and, and walk this with me? And I said, I don't have an option. It's either you or I'm not going to be here. One of the two. So whatever you say, I'll follow you. And, and that's really how it came to be. And um, I placed all my trust in Sheila. And, and to this day, we are extremely close. Um, we talk probably once a week, sometimes more. Sometimes it's once every two weeks, but um, she's, she's my angel in physical form and she saved my life and she continues to help me heal and grow and, and give me tools that I can pass on to the people that I work with. Um, it's, it's amazing, Jim, to say the least. Um, I, I owe this lady so much and I've now started to connect some of my clients with her because I just know that that's the piece they need. And to me, it's just Chuck, divine intervention. How many people are walking around today with a card in their pocket with your name and number on it? I'd like to think thousands. I've given out boxes and boxes and boxes of cards just with, with, without any intention of when they may need it. But just my, my message is you don't have to do this alone. You never have to be alone ever again. You need anything, you call me. I'm standing ready. Whatever day, whatever day, time, doesn't matter. Just call. How much of your journey, Chuck, to the surface uh, and the good things that you have in your life now, love of Jamie and, and uh, Bethany and Brooke, uh, the relationship you had with your mother until she passed last June, the relationship you have with your father, with your siblings, how much of that is because the path that you walk down with Sheila uh, hand in hand has led you to say that part of my therapy and part of my cure is being on a mission to help others? I, I think the majority of it, if not all of it. Um, because once I started that journey with Sheila, everything really went to a whole new level and it continues to, to grow and prosper. As I continue to grow and prosper and heal, it allows me to open up more, share more. I'm no longer embarrassed of the things that I went through. Um, as a matter of fact, Jim, it's quite the opposite. I look at all of this as one of the greatest gifts that, that I've ever received. Because if I didn't go through all of the things that I went through, I wouldn't be able to reach back, reach to my sides, reach forward and help others. Um, because I, I've, I've walked the walk, I've done it, I've been there. I understand what they're feeling, what they're going through, what's going through their mind. And um, I just think without any of that, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. You still have dark days. You're not fixed. No. What what do you do to dig yourself out of a hole you know you're going into? Meditation and and what I call me time is is very, very important to me. Um, even just this past weekend, and I don't know, I, I don't always have to know anymore what it is, but I could feel myself starting to slide on Saturday and um, and into Sunday. And, and Sunday was a rather tough day for me. Um, but what, for me, what I do, Jim, then is it's, it's rest, it's alone time and in meditation. Cause I, I bring myself back to center. I reground myself and I reconnect myself with, 
for me, it's God, the universe, whatever people want to call it. Um, but but I, if I do those things, meditation, reground myself and have some me time, I can see myself and I can feel myself pulling right out of it again. How important is it to recognize that you're pulling that blanket of anxiety over your head because it's warm and comfortable. How often is how important it is for you to see the signs of where you're going and know that you have the opportunity and the responsibility to interdict, to, to, to take steps to deliberately reject that path. It, it's, it's vital because I remember the days that I didn't know that that's where I was going and where it led. And it's to, comfortable, right? You, you've been oh, there. You know what it feels like. I, I know what it feels like. And, and it's dark and it's lonely and misery loves company, as they say. And, and when you get there, boy, the, the voices and the stories that go on in your head and, and the tape that replays is, is comfortable because you've been there. But it's dark and it's lonely. And it's for me and I think for, for millions of others, it's a dangerous place to be. Because I have a lot of guys that I played with, Jim, that are no longer here or played against, that are no longer here, that I know that they got to that place, that dark and lonely place, and they made a permanent decision to a very temporary situation. And, and, and now we're, we're, we're walking this journey without them. And, and they were blinded by their own pain not yes. to realize what their actions would do to those around them. They couldn't see it because they were so absorbed in their own pain that they had no comprehension or an unwillingness to grasp what their behaviors or their actions would do to crush the lives of those around them. You've seen that firsthand. You've seen friends and how their families are destroyed after that. Sheila was your angel. She gave you help. You're, you're now a deputized angel. You're helping others. And look at what the gifts you have. You have a loving and supporting wife in Jamie. You have the love of Bethany and Brooke and know that you are a positive influence in their life. And rather than being that tough, macho guy who shows no pain, who shows no emotions, who everything is fine in life, what has your interaction with those two girls, what is that, what is that different about your sharing your challenges with them what impact do you think it's had on their life number one you're there for them you're providing for them they are in a loving and caring family so we know that what about your honesty and your challenges do you think how does that impacted those two girls i think it's it's made them stronger and it's it's increased their self-acceptance that when whenever they're going through something that it's okay I've sat with both of them and had conversations about the things that daddy has gone through and sometimes the things that I still go through and, and just shared with them that it's okay, but that I'm working through it and whatever it is that they're working through, they can do it too. As long as they verbalize, ask for help. The tools, the tools are self-awareness. I realize I'm going there. I'm not sure why, but I know I'm going there. Meditation is important to me. Uh, embracing the fact is there's a higher being that's going to is important in your life. Uh, knowing that if you don't write things, it's going to hurt not only you, but the people around you talk about the other tools that you and Sheila worked on. So we, we really talked in depth and still do about our purpose and why we're here and, and, and to understand who I was at a core um, was a big, big piece. And, and to understand that really I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and that it doesn't have to be perfect, that perfect is exactly what it is. Because I always held myself to a standard that everything had to be perfect. It had to be the, something that was really pie in the sky. And she made me understand through a lot of conversation, and she still reminds me that of this today, that we're all perfect exactly how we are. Does it mean that we don't have room for improvement or there's not things that need to be healed or anything? No, it doesn't. But what it means is that we're perfect exactly how we are, because if we were supposed to be different, we would be. But we're exactly who we are at this moment, because this is who we're supposed to be. And that was a big piece for my self-acceptance and, and to really start to fall in love with who I am 
And I can share with you, Jim, that every morning I get up, as a matter of fact, I did it right before we, we connected today. I do a gratitude journal every morning. Tell us about that. I, I have my book and uh, it's sitting right behind me. And I just, I take 15 or 20 minutes and I just write down the things that I'm grateful for. And sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. But some of the, the things that are very, very constant are I'm thankful that I'm me. And, and again, that's not an arrogant statement. I'm just really grateful. Finally, after 51 years, I'm grateful that I'm me. And I'm grateful for this journey that I'm on. Because it's, it's a journey of great purpose. It's, it's a, a journey that really is divinely guided. Um, I thank God every day for my parents. I thank God for my family, for our health and, and all the abundance of things that he's given me. The, um, and, and I just, but when I do that, it opens my heart to really look at the things first thing in the morning of all the great things in my life, all my friends, all the acquaintances that I have, my amazing business, the people that I get to touch, the people that touch me. And, and people may look and hear this and, and understand that Chuck is giving, but I can assure you, Jim, and, and I've asked many clients this on many different occasions after some amazing conversations. I will end, I'm like, was that, was that conversation good for you today? And they'll be like, oh my gosh, Chuck, you know, it was amazing. I'm like, okay, I just wanted to make sure that I gave you as much as you gave me because I'm walking away from this conversation today better. And that's the one thing that I love about, one of the things that I love about the work that I do is there's, there's always a two-way street of giving and my clients give me so much. And, and this relationship that you and I have today, this is filling my heart. This is, this is setting me up that regardless of what happens today, this is, this is setting me up to have a really, really good day. And, and I'm, I'm beyond grateful for that. And that may sound funny to a lot of people, but I've just found gratitude in what some people would call some of the smallest things in life. But for me, they're some of the biggest. So Chuck, you spend uh, so much of your time now speaking with audiences, sharing your story. What happens when you do that in public? Has there ever been a time where someone doesn't come up to you afterwards? It's, a ma it's magical. Um, people come up and they, they, they just say, thank you. They have eyes full of tears and they just say, thank you. And that's really all that they can get out. And that's all they have to say, because I can feel their hurt. I can feel what they're going through. Um, a lot of times I'll give them my number and say, when you're ready, feel free to call me and we'll talk about it because I just want, and I've said this already, but I want people to know they never have to be alone. They do not have to do this alone. Because when you do it alone, um, sometimes the, 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 the final circumstance isn't very good. Final outcome isn't very good. Loneliness is the big, lightly spoken about disease that seems to be plaguing us all. Very much so. And I, I believe, Jim, that we're just scratching the surface from the pandemic of that loneliness, of this mental health crisis. I think you're starting to see more and more and more people putting their hand up and saying, I just can't do this by myself anymore. And it's incredibly empowering. Every time I share my story, it's healing, but it's also empowering for me to just shed a little bit, another layer, another layer so that people can see who I am at my core. And that by doing that, how empowering it can be and liberating it can be for them as well to just say, you know what? I, I just want to talk. Can we just talk? And then you just give them that space and, and it's incredibly healing. Someone's listening out there, uh, watching this on YouTube, listening on their favorite podcast network. And they're saying, my God, my brother, my sister, my mom, my kid is struggling. Chuck, what should they do? I would go give them a hug, tell them that they're deeply loved and that it's okay not to be okay and that they don't have to do this alone. Ask them if they're willing to speak to somebody, and if they are, and if you need to make the call for them, make the call for them. Who do they call? You can call a life coach, you can call a friend, you can call a psychologist, whoever they're willing and, and, and willing to open up to. It, it, can, it can be their best friend, it can be their grandmother, whoever it is, 
It doesn't have to be a licensed professional. I don't think that's the first step is just getting them to speak to someone. From there, you can make the next step of calling somebody that, that can help them at a greater level. Maybe it's a hospital, depending on what the situation is, but just have them speak to someone they're comfortable with, someone they can open up to, someone that's not gonna judge them and that will love them unconditionally. And once they do that, Jim, I, the doors usually fly open to, to people that are willing to help and then you can make the next steps. But it's getting that first crack of the door. I love what you're saying. But in candor, I think there's a gap between that, that arm around the shoulder, the conversation. When people are in a tough way, I think there's a missing piece of how we can help people who need help to get access. And, uh, you know, involved in, in healthcare here in the New York area, we have wonderful professionals, but this, the, the leap from the phone call to getting professional services help, which is not, there isn't enough of, there's a chasm there that I think we have to talk about. It won't be for you and I to talk about today, uh, but I think your message is so powerful and so meaningful. I think the problem is huge and getting worse. And I, as you say, I think COVID has contributed to that, to that uh, worsening of the problem in so many ways. Uh, and uh, and we're just beginning to sense of what ways that the impact that COVID's having on on all of us. I think there's a missing piece here in the treatment scheme to help people who want to help somebody else or need help themselves to really uh, grab a, a ring and get out. And uh, I just don't think there's enough access and and likely <laughs> won't be for a long time. But I think it's something we need to talk about and figure out a way to address. Chuck, uh, you've made my day a better day. Just having gotten to know you now, uh, this short period of time has been a blessing for me. And I'm just thrilled to be able to share you and your story with our community. And we'll find my job now is to do it as many different ways as we can, because your message is important. You as a person are important. And the work that you do in helping other people is critically important. And I'll underline critically important. Uh, thank you for what you do, Chuck. Thank you for having the uh, the uh, bravery to share your story and the uh, drive to make it your mission to help other people in their life, knowing that as you do that, you're helping yourself. And in there is one mighty valuable lesson. Chuck, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>